This session is brought to you by Bloomerang. Bloomerang is a cloud-based donor management and fundraising software for nonprofits. Bloomerang offers an easy-to-use, clean, modern interface, all while helping nonprofits decrease donor attrition and increase revenue for better fundraising. To learn more, visit bloomerang.co. Hello and welcome to Everyday Advocacy is Fundraising. I'm so pleased to have three wonderful speakers with me today. First, Charity Tyler, who has two decades of nonprofit experience and in 2015 joined the Cedar Rapids Public Library Foundation as its executive director. Charity currently serves as the United for Libraries programming chair and was recently elected the 2021 and 2022 president for United for Libraries. We will also hear from Amber McNamara, the Community Relations Manager for the Cedar Rapids Public Library, who says she spends her days scheming new ways to draw the community into the library and the library into the community. She spent her career before libraries in nonprofit marketing, branding, and communications. And finally, John Kraska, who is the co-founder and executive director of Every Library, the only national political action committee for libraries. Since 2012, Every Library has supported public libraries in numerous funding negotiations with elected officials and on 110 election days to help secure over $1.8 billion in stable tax money for libraries. And with that, I'll throw it to you. Thank you so much, Christina. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for hosting us and allowing us to share what we have all done um, over the last several years to support libraries. It's really important to understand that everyday advocacy really is fundraising. And that's because you can't wait until a crisis to start asking for money. We know that building relationships is essential to telling our story. We can't come in at the last minute and say, oh wait, hey, do you have $100,000? Do you have a million dollars? We're gonna have to shut our lights off. What we need to do is consistently build relationships with key stakeholders, um, understand who they are, understand what the messages that appeal to them are, but also understand the story. We in library world collect data. Numbers are very important to the work that we do, but the numbers and data don't work unless you have a story behind those numbers. And the story is what inspires and what really empowers our stakeholders to make decisions. We need to arm our stakeholders with information that makes it easy for them to want to say yes to our requests. And John's going to talk about um, who our stakeholders are. The, uh, the this is a lens. People are wired to listen in different ways, uh, and and there are four types of of uh, folks who will support an idea, a, a campaign, a cause, a crusade, a candidate, um, who will join parties and do things as prosaic as make a donation to a library. Uh, there, there's four ways that folks are again, wired to listen to those stories. And we wanna put these frames out for you as we go through the rest of this presentation today, because you've got a preponderance of, in well, perhaps relational supporters. Folks who are part of your inner circle, who are part of your friends group and your foundation, uh, who are part of the usual suspects. But these are people who have a relationship to the library, perhaps as a user, perhaps to a librarian, perhaps to the leadership team, uh, it's a smaller inner circle, of course, but we want to draw more people into it. And a little bit later in the presentation, Amber and Charity are going to talk about how they've done some of those things to bring people closer in. The next ring out, though, of supporters, the way the lens works for people, the way they listen to your stories, those people who are ideologically aligned. That might be around literacy, and that one's an easy conversation for library folks to have, but it could also be about workforce or about small businesses or about people at the margins or right now where we are in America in crisis. Ideologically, folks who agree with what you do, who don't necessarily use the library, who are the ones who are gonna show up and say, yes, I'm glad somebody is doing the work, but they need to hear from you as the, state, as the, uh, the, the, the campaign managers about, well, how do we align our value systems around that ideology? The third ring out, 
is a type of supporter who is, uh, well, in the political sciences, they're aversion supporters. They're the ones who are like, let's not be dumb today. Let's do the thing that makes some sense. Let's, well, in, a, in politics, it's often I'm against that candidate because, you know, the enemy of my enemy. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not negative here. It's, can we use a little bit of smart money in town for a change? Could we not drop the people through the safety net? Could we not? And I know that doesn't, it might not feel comfortable always using the word not, but to define the negative about who isn't going to be served if we don't have the funding, who is going to, well, how are we going to potentially fail if we don't have the support? There's a whole group of folks who are motivated around that don't be dumb for a change. And then in politics, there's the access supporter. We see it in politics all the time, the $10,000 plate dinner back when that was legal. But the $10,000 plate dinner that gives you access to, and I know some of you folks here on this webinar, on this uh, conference, actually do have access-based supporters. You're a bit of a unicorn inside library land. You put on great parties. You put on great events. You've got amazing authors who are coming in. You've got celebrities. I don't want to be shy about those people. Let's get more of those folks in as those types of supporters. You know, John says supporters, and when I think about uh, supporters, I also think about stakeholders. And we use that word a lot in libraries as we think about who are the different groups of people that we need to connect with, who we need to share our message with. Um, but stakeholders is a big, scary word. Um, they really are just people. And when it comes down to it, what we need to do is connect our strategy to our stakeholders. And the way that we do that is to identify those groups that John talked about, who are our relational people, who are our relational supporters, the people who will always align themselves with the work that we're doing in the library. And then we need to give them a structure through which we can share our messages so that they can go out into the world and share that message with their friends and their family and their coworkers. Um, that structured approach really allows us to get our message out um, and helps us tailor what we need the community to do uh, along the lines of what the goals are of the library. When we think about who our relational supporters are, our stakeholder groups, we instantly start thinking about our foundation, our friends, our staff members, the people that work with us every day voluntarily because they come here as volunteers and pull holds and work with the public. So we need to find ways to connect our strategy to those groups. And one way in which the library in Cedar Rapids has done that is to create an advocacy committee. It seems really simple, but this structured approach means that we have a method to get our message out to the stakeholders on a regular basis. So creating an advocacy committee where we pull somebody from each of those individual stakeholder groups, somebody from the foundation, we have staff members on the committee, we have um, people who are members of our friends organizations on the committee, and they all come together around a shared goal. And those goals all come from the library strategic plan. Uh, it may be that the goal we have is tied to an upcoming election. It may be that we have some sort of levy vote that we have coming up that we know we have to prepare for, or it may just be as simple as, you know, we need to be ready for budget season when our city is going to decide how much money the library is going to have in its budget this year, and we need people to show up and support us. So by having that advocacy committee regularly meet, we're able to keep our message flowing throughout the community all year long. Uh, regular meetings are important. Connecting people with or our strategy with a calendar around key moments in our year is also important. And it's one way that we help provide some strategy to our stakeholders. So that calendar might be tied to things that happen across the nation, like National Library Week. It might be National Library Card Sign Up Month, and we can arm our volunteers and our advocacy committee to go out and do door-to-door -door library card sign up, for example. But it may also be budget season, like I said, when we need people to show up at the budget hearings and be there to show support for the library. The key behind all of this is understanding who those individual stakeholder groups are and making sure that there's a structure in place that allows us to put the right message with the right group. The uh, interesting thing about the way people listen um, the messaging environment that you need to put out into the field 
has one of three axes to it. You know, like the X axes, Y axes, Z axes. You know, sometimes the X axes is bigger than the Y, is bigger than the Z. And there's some component of how people want to be addressed, want to listen to you, to those messages that you need to be aware of before you start the conversations, especially when they're around funding, when they're around political action, when they're around support. There's a, um, a coalition approach that says we are in common cause around a, 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 a population. Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. We're in a common concern around a population where we have compassion for a population. Uh, it might be little kids. It might be uh, a summer reading in that COVID slide, summer reading gap. It might be seniors. It might be community connections. It might be people looking for work. It might be small businesses. We, our heart goes out. And there's a version of there but for the grace of God go I. And how is our mission, vision, and values of the library lined up with somebody's compassion? And if you're a compassionate person yourself, that's a very easy conversation to start. But pride is another reason that people give. Pride is another reason that people vote. Pride is another reason that politicians run for office and want to improve their community. We're in a common cause about this hometown, this place we both live, Main Street, uh, the new parks, the new transportation networks, the uh, just not having potholes. Who do we want to be together? That pride conversation is something that filters relationally, ideologically, for aversion people, especially aversion people, and for those folks who want access. And then we're in a different moment now with this virtual conference than we were a year ago in Calgary. There's also concern that is an axis of communication. I am concerned about, I am concerned for, I'm fearful of, and again, I don't wanna go negative on things here, but there is a legitimate moment here uh, in, in our country, in, in our North American world together. What about the gaps? What about the margins? What about the honesty it takes? I don't know a single donor, I don't know a single donor who wants to put money into a, into a cause that should be taken care of in the form of taxes. And I know a lot of politicians right now, well, they're politicians if they're the bad guy, elected officials if they're the good guy. I don't know a single elected official who doesn't want a small amount of smart money to produce results. And understanding that there's these three different axes that are more important sometimes for one person than another, and that there's different ways that they're gonna re relate to the core mission, vision, and values I'm looking forward to hearing what Charity and Amber have to, to, to tell us the rest of this presentation. That's great, John, because what we've done in Cedar Rapids and what I think is really important and critical to what you're talking about is really understanding who those groups are, what their values are, and then, like you said, tying those to the messages that will really hit home with, with them. Um, and so for us in Cedar Rapids, we had to look at what we're, who are our external stakeholders. So who are these groups of people? And then how do we put the messages to them in the right way, in the right method that works for them? We're all learning differently, especially today, than maybe we did before. But you know, understanding who these groups of people are and what really matters to them is gonna help us tailor our messaging so that we're giving the right message to the right group and we're gonna get a lot further that way. Um, we have four different groups of stakeholders in Cedar Rapids the city council, county supervisors, those are those elected officials that you talked about. Those are the people that are currently in office and they're making decisions every day that have an impact on the work happening in our communities. So they are incredibly important stakeholders. And if I've learned anything in my job, it's that the more we can arm these individuals with answers to the questions that their constituents have, the more successful we will be. So we wanna make sure that we're getting them the messages in the right way, in a timely fashion, and consistently, so that they're never in a moment where they don't know the answer to a question that's coming to them from someone who's voting for them, right? So that's key. Also, candidates for local office. This is huge as well. These are the people who care enough about your local community that they're they're running for local office. Um, and we all know that's not a glamorous thing. Um, and um, so understanding that that's an opportunity to engage with somebody who is so passionate about what's happening in their community that they want to play a role in local office, that's somebody you want to connect with, even if they don't get elected, right? Because then you're giving somebody who's that ambitious and that connected and that 
engaged, you're empowering them with the messages that you want out in the community about the library and the value of the work that's happening every day. Local donors are another group. They are a huge stakeholder group. They're going to need a different message than your candidates will. They're caring about different things. So you have to tailor what you're talking about to the needs of that individual group. And then the community as a whole, that's a stakeholder group in and of itself. What is the message that the library is sharing with the greater community? But in the same tone, what is the message that the foundation is sharing with the community, that our friends organization is sharing with the community? How do we make sure that those things are aligned? If we're all working independently, we're not helping each other, right? And so it's really key to have that group of people who meet regularly, who are on the same plan, who can share the same message at the same time in the same ways to help get that out there to the greater community. Um, and so making sure that you've got those key messages identified for your different stakeholder groups and then creating that calendar of events so that you understand what's happening and when it's happening and you can share that message out through your advocacy group is really, really important. Everybody learns differently, like I said, but everybody needs to be connected with just a little bit differently. And so you have to tailor that message to that individual stakeholder group. And what's equally important, um, so one of the groups that she talked about was the city council. We already referenced that we need to make it easy for the people who are making decisions to say yes when we need something. It's not about you know sweeping in at the last minute in a crisis. We need to arm them with information. And that's where our advocacy committee really comes into play. And the talking points that um, the team is prepared with is important as well. The Advocacy Committee, um, Amber already referenced, it's our trustees, it's our foundation board members, it's members of our friends groups, and each of those individuals is assigned to meet with the current city council as well as candidates. When you're meeting with them, it's not about an ask. It's literally about making sure that our messages are aligned with the library's priorities and strategic goals, and you're arming them with information so that if one of their constituents, or in the case of a candidate, a future constituent, is asking a question, they know how to answer it. You're preparing them to be that public service officer to respond to communities' questions, to respond to their needs, and also come back to us and know that they can communicate with us, and it's an open door. It's also important that it's just not the um, loan library director or a loan employee at the library. You have advocates and volunteers that are out in the community meeting with each of these individuals. We are providing them literally with talking points so that they understand what the library's priorities are as well, so that they can convey these library's prior, library priorities to their constituents or even in social gatherings when people come up and ask them questions. We're prepping them and we're always keeping them informed. And this is important because the city council approves the budget. This is important because in our case, um, the county supervisors also decide how much money they want to support our budget with. And it's about advocacy now, but it's also about advocacy in the future. We, I keep saying it, but it's not about a crisis. It's about communicating the long-term goals of the library, um, answering questions and making sure that they understand what's coming down the pike, what current needs are, but also what future needs are. Making sure that um, there are tours, give city council members a tour of the library, meet with them, offer to buy, if there's a coffee shop, offer to buy them a cup of coffee and walk them around, although they might not be able to accept that coffee, coffee it depends. But making sure that um, they feel comfortable in the library space, answer questions and share the stories. I've already said without data, um, or without stories, the data really is meaning, meaningless. So um, understand what the needs are of the library um, based on work from the advocacy committee, but also being able to communicate those needs um, so that you can um, get the decisions you want and you need when budget time comes around. We actually have a really um, good example of this in Cedar Rapids um, because we went through a process in uh, 2015, we were up for a levy vote to renew a, a tax levy locally, and that failed, um, unfortunately. And because of that, the library was forced to cut hours in both of our locations. We were 
forced to reduce services and resources to the community, and the impact was really devastating locally. Um, and so after that, after that loss, we really had to look around and say like, okay, we, we didn't get what we wanted. Let's look at the polling data and the polling data is telling us, you know, we're not gonna pass this tax levy vote, at least not anytime soon in our current state. And so how can we restore funding and access to the library in a different way? We're a municipal library. That means our funding comes through the city. And so um, our focus shifted then to all of our local elected officials, um, the city staff, and also anybody running for public office. And so we were fascinated in uh, 2016, the field locally was actually really large in our city council. We spent a great deal of time and effort being really intentional, having meetings with all of the candidates who are running for public office, as well as all of the existing city council members. And we did exactly what Charity said. We walked them through our buildings. We um, talked to them about the services the library provides. We shared stories that were meaningful with them. We gave them data. We gave them whole packets they could take with them so that they understood what the library was doing in the community. And we also listened to them and heard from them what was important to them and their stakeholders, because they have those as well, so that we could understand what their priorities are. That's very helpful in terms of advocating for the library in the future. Uh, when the election rolled around in 2016, then we actually had a turnover of five of the nine council seats in our community. And all of a sudden that meant sort of a shift in power. And so when we came around to that next budget season, which would have been our budget for 2018, uh, when our director was standing up in front of the city council with the budget that she presented, which was flat because that's what she had sort of been planned and told that she needed to do, that group of people said to her, you know what? You're not asking for enough money. We need to give you more because we wanna see some of those services come back. What do you need? And so they gave her a little bit of money with a promise of more money and the whole thing sort of came together. And within two years, we were able to restore the funding that we had lost due to that tax levy. So what that told us was that very unique situation was a result of really important and intentional advocacy. It meant setting up those meetings with people and having those discussions and hearing what their priorities were and speaking directly to those. There's the uh, formal and the informal types of candidate engagement. I want to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole here. As a uh, executive director for a political action committee, we're set up as a 501c4. The all y'all on this conference are mainly C3s. There's a big difference what you can do as a C3 versus a C4, but I'm not suggesting that you change your stripes. I need you to work within, in the United States, this 501c3 environment. Um, informal conversations with candidates, whether they're incumbent or insurgent candidates, matter. Same way that, that Amber and Charity were just talking about. But formally, there are opportunities within the 501c3 strictures to do candidate surveys and to do candidate forums, provided that your own bylaws allow you to be politically active. If you're gonna say, John, uh, we're not politically active, then you can just tune out for a minute here, but this is kind of interesting. That the 501c3s in our life have the ability to have those conversations with candidates in a nonpartisan way. If the forum is open to the public, and if the uh, if all candidates are are um, uh, invited, that's in the United States of America. That's under the Canada election law as well. The Canada Election Act has the same three points enumerated. In the UK, it's a little bit different. Uh, if you're a chartered institute, of course, or a chartered organization, you can petition government in a different way. But the NGO community in England still has that opportunity to talk to candidates who are either standing or running for office, depending on where you are. The survey is very important as well uh, as a formal mechanism. Sure, if you wanted to do a candidate forum, that's awesome. But the survey too, because as a 501c3 organization, either independently, because you are postured towards uh, supporting the library or in partnership with an organization, again, nonpartisan, but something in the United States like the League of Women Voters or another nonpartisan voter uh, engagement organization locally, um, who, how, do they, how do they feel about libraries? How do they feel about the way that librarians are solution providers? Um, you can publish that, and you can publish it to your members if you're if you're a membership organization. You can publish it through, well, like the, in the in Dallas, we worked with the City of Dallas Public Library on a candidate forum. We had five forums across the entire city. The library was both the location, but it was also the topic 
of this nonpartisan open to all candidates. There were 56 people running. And we also did a candidate survey about their attitudes around how the library is a solution, how the librarians are solution providers. Dallas Morning News picked it up. I got to tell you, it, the, the next budget cycle that the uh, city council had, number one priority for the community was the library. Number two was police and fire. Number three, I don't remember, because number one was the library, and I could retire now. How are the values, vision, and mission of the, li of the candidate aligned with the library? They might not even realize it. They might not have even thought about it before until you connect the dots for them and vice versa. How's the library's mission, vision, and values aligned with the candidate's platform? It doesn't turn you into a partisan actor to also care about the same people or that same place you call home. That's such amazing information because understanding the values and understanding and being able to survey um, those that have influence or have power essentially is really key um, but it's also important not to forget about our donors so this is the public library fundraising conference and what i do every day is advocate for my library every day when i'm in meetings whether i'm presenting to a rotary or a kiwanis club or i'm visiting with a plan giving donor or um, chatting with a foundation officer and i'm preparing to write a grant every day what i am doing is advocating for my library so it's important this goes back to um, amber's original message the library has key message points. They have a strategic plan. And so for you, um, you know, whether you're a development officer, whether you're a foundation director or a friends board member or president or even a uh, friends fundraising, you know, staff member, it is so important to make sure that your key messages are in alignment with the libraries because what cannot happen is that you go and you talk about your book sales and what your um, what your money is funding and then the library director talks to that group about four or five six months later and that's not their priority that's not you can't you need to have a cohesive message so that you're empowering your community influencers so it's the donors and the influencers with information because they're going to talk so word of mouth is so powerful so when you think about your face-to-face -face meetings your corporate partners so the corporate level decision makers um, often maybe they're golf buddies with another person who's a key influencer or maybe they're uh, members of the country club or maybe they are members of a uh, bridge club or something like that whatever it is these key stakeholders at the corporate level um, at the community leader influencer and major gift donors that's so important that you're dripping on them all of the information that is necessary for them to understand what's going on, but also for them to understand what ties to their values, um, what ties to their personal mission or their company's mission to make it easier to raise funds for library programs, but also to arm them with information so that when they're talking to the city council member because they're getting ready to build a building or something, or they're needing to um, get some something within the city um, policies or parameters changed, they have information. If the library comes up or maybe that's their priority and they all of a sudden turn into your key advocate. It's so important to make sure to arm them with information. And I talked to, um, I really referenced the major gift donors and the private foundations because those are the people that you're asking for big chunks of money. And if you cannot actively and accurately communicate an aligned strategy for your library, they might be very confused as to why you're asking them um, for funding for Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, in my case, so for a children's program, and you're hammering your need for that program, and then all of a sudden, within a matter of a month, you're calling them up again to talk about a mobile technology lab, right? That STEM um, outreach to senior centers and adults as well as kids, but what about literacy? What about access? What about um, early literacy, kindergarten readiness? So making sure that you are communicating on a daily basis um, what those values are is so important to our stakeholders. Other ways that you can do this include your newsletter and your e-news. Um, so we always wanna make sure you're communicating that. And a key tool 
Um, I am not from library world. I came from corporate America. And so using words that are not library speak is so important. If you attended last year's conference, you might have, might have had a chance to attend the Ease for Libraries um, session. And it's just making sure that you're using common language to communicate what a library does. So that's something that I would encourage you to also do is take out all library speak of your advocacy talking points because I was lost for about a year. <laughs> and so it needs to make it easily understood information, whether it's a face-to-face -face meeting, a newsletter, or an e-news. That's awesome. Well, I also think about, when we talk about sharing that, that information I think about our greater community and the individuals within the community who are your um, very connected champions and how do you arm them with the message that you want as well. And so from like the library's perspective, this is all about starting the conversation with the community about the purpose of the library. We discovered quickly after we lost our levy campaign that people really didn't fundamentally understand what a library was. Um, why we had a public library. And so we had to really start at zero. What is the purpose of the public library in the community? Um, we are something that you fund through your, your tax dollars or through um, our donations that we get through our foundation. And, and so we need them to understand that the, the purpose behind the library is to be a resource um, for the community. And so make sure that you start with that. Using that common language that Charity talked about is incredibly key. And also taking advantage of a captive audience when you have one. Within the library buildings, for example, are you messaging the basic things that people need to know about what a library is and why it's there? Um, but also getting tools out to the greater community. Your champions that exist out in the community want to be able to tell their friends that they are library supporters and lovers. Um, and so we did simple things like creating yard signs. You know, we're in Iowa and we love yard signs in Iowa, especially around elections. And so use that to your advantage. Think about how you can get your message out on a yard sign that a library champion is going to put up and suddenly you're driving around town and you see your message show up in somebody's yard, I mean, it's a pretty epic feeling. And so take advantage of the tools that exist to get your message out there to the greater community as well. And then also be really intentional when you start thinking about your community partners and the work that's happening in the community. Another stakeholder group are the people that the library works with um, on a regular basis. I'm talking about the nonprofits that exist in your community, um, the community resources that are doing work within uh, the greater area who need the library, who rely on the library for things like meeting room spaces, access to materials, uh, staff to come and help them with projects. You need to align your messaging with those community partners so that they understand what you're doing, what your goals are as well, and so that you can support one another. If you have a strategic plan, and you should, the library strategic plan should include um, a messaging that goes out to those community partners as well. And we all need to tell that shared story of the work that we're doing in the community when you align yourselves with those organizations in the community, when it comes time for something to happen, like a budget season, which I keep talking about because it's so important, um, or a levy vote or any other major issue that's happening in the community, those, that's a stakeholder group that will show up because they rely on the library as well. And so you need to make sure that you're aligning yourself with them and the work that they're doing. You're not duplicating work, but instead you're lifting each other up all for the greater good. All right, we're in a particularly singular moment in, in, in the world right now, um, and it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge that. Uh, some of these conversations we were having were for, uh, every day doesn't always look like this. Um, and yet, I'm gonna tell you this, um, you need to listen to what our, our colleagues here from Cedar Rapids are telling you, because they've come into this uh, new funding uh, support from their elected officials and the growth that Charity's done with donors in a post-crisis environment. They've been very humble. Uh, they haven't talked about what happened to Cedar Rapids and how the library was part of that recovery and how the staff went through some real t strong times together, some difficult times together, and came out a lot stronger. Um, the idea of talking in a full voice and in real honesty about the mission, vision, and values of your library, these folks know how to do this um, in, in that kind of, um, well, 
disaster and into just an everyday crisis. Um, the mission of your library hasn't changed, despite the fact that we're moving internationally from disaster into everyday crisis. Your donors and your elected officials want to hear about how the particulars of the way that you're, you're realizing your mission has changed. And out of the pivot that went on in Cedar Rapids, because they had to accommodate it during time of reconstruction, time of rebuilding, time of reconnection with each other. The particular way that your mission is being realized is what your donors and your elected officials need to hear about, and it's on you to connect the dots for them. Um, the core of the library needs something. There's a verb there. We're talking a lot about messaging. We're talking a lot about the who is doing the work and where's the money going to go. But the verb here, what kind of support can you ask for of these stakeholders? What kind of gifts do people want to see that go to the right well, solutions? And what kind of involvement do you need from the elected officials in your community? I really appreciate the chance to collaborate with both of you, Amber and Charity, today and to be part of this international conversation around fundraising for libraries. I wonder what your final thoughts are, though. Amber, you want to go first, Charity? Yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in and, and just I, I want to say this was great for me as well. And, and um, you know, we are in such a unique time in our history. And from my standpoint, one of the most important things, and you touched on this, John, is, you know, it's really important to capture the stories of the work that's being done right now. Um, we're so quick to move on to the day to day crisis like you talk about. Uh, but it's really critical to future storytelling that we have those um, those historical documents and that we know exactly the work that's being done. There's amazing things happening in libraries across the country right now and across the world. And so make sure you're taking time to capture those stories, because I do think, you know, we've got lots of data points. Um, and those data points, all of a sudden, all of the data points that we used to judge success by have been thrown out the window. Um, you know, so we have to start thinking about what success looks like in a totally different way. And what a great opportunity to share the value of the library um, with your donors and your supporters and your elected officials um, in this unique time. And I would agree and add to that what I hear from other libraries and trustees and stakeholders across the country um, in that you know, we have sold our libraries as more than a house that holds books for years now. We've sold that, sold our libraries to our stakeholders as community centers, as gathering spaces. And in this new light, um, where funding really could be, um, you know, municipalities around the country, around the world are struggling right now in their budgets. And so this is such a pivotal time for us to be able to communicate, 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 and um, gather your internal stakeholders together um, to understand what is going on in our library today. Um, what are we still doing, just doing a little bit differently? What are our future plans for the next six months to 12 months? And sh being able to share that um, collectively is so important because everyday advocacy is fundraising and we can't wait until a crisis happens to start asking for the money so thank you christina thank you everyone for hosting us and we look forward to answering your questions well hi hi ladies how are you doing thank you so much for being here oh and let me unmute you my apologies there we go amber and charity hi Hi. Hi. So um, so we have a lot of really great questions. One of the things that I would like to point out to those listening is you were one of the first groups of speakers that reported um, for us kind of early on. And I wanted to point out, I actually just went and looked it up. You recorded May 27th. Uh, and that was a pivotal day. And I want to ask you in the last three weeks, um, has anything that you just heard yourself say changed at all? Do you, you know, do you still, have you adjusted anything that you would do in the last three weeks with regard to George Floyd and a lot of the social justice movements that we're seeing? And has that impacted your work at all? Amber, I'm going to let you take that one. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I think what we, the way in which it's mostly impacted us is um, making us pause 
um, a lot before we start putting out any kind of messaging. Um, I think we internally have um, a review process in place and we've actually been undergoing this um, previously to understand where uh, bias may exist within the library system and find ways to get rid of that. So things like going find free. Um, but we also understand that, um, that this is an important moment for our community to sort of come together around those messages of social justice and that libraries provide a unique um, window into you know, accessing information for everyone in our community. And so they're relying on us to provide them with access to information and access to resources. So from a messaging standpoint, the library and our foundation and supporting organizations have sort of rallied together to ensure that what we're talking about um, helps support that community message um, and helps pr promote those resources that we do have available so that people can educate themselves. Um, and you know, we want to make sure that we're providing access in the most um, open way possible and that we are getting getting things right at the library as well. Great, good. Charity, any thoughts on that? You know, one of the things that I often share with my stakeholders um, and donors is that um, the city and the library is part of the city has gone through in the last year, um, looking at every process through an equity lens. And I'm so proud of our library and our library leadership because they have begun that process even before the city um, began that process. And so many of the things that our library has already been doing, whether it's from the hiring standpoint or from, um, from like um, Amber referenced the finds free policy, we were slated to go finds free July 1st, but when we shut down in March, it was, all right, I guess we're gonna go finds free now because we couldn't allow people to return books. And so how can you find them when we're making them late? So yeah. um, we've already been doing that work and we're so proud to continue to be a resource for our partners to learn more. And um, we on social media have been trying to share um, the list that our collections team and materials team put together on um, how someone can learn more about the social justice movement or um, the anti-racism materials that people can check out. And so just trying to promote and um, help the library's voice be louder if that's a if that's a way to put it, sure. to make sure that we are um, amplifying their messaging and still being a good partner and resource to our um, our donors and our community members. That's great, and thank you for letting me um, you know diverge for a minute. And I wanted to give you the opportunity as our our first group that went around three weeks ago. The world has again changed so much, so. <laughs> Let's get to some of the questions that people ask, and pardon me while I look at those. So uh, you mentioned things that should be taken, are taken by taxes. So someone is really asking about, you know, the whole not by taxes alone. Um, can you share any ideas for messaging that you have around that? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that uh, led to our levy failure that Amber mentioned was the uh, an extreme mistrust of government and how they use our taxes. And so to differentiate how donor dollars impact library services and collection and resources, we have, um, we really work to outline what the foundation supports. And so I put together a document at the end of every fiscal year that talks about what are the programs and services and or collection materials that donor dollars are going to be supporting this fiscal year. And we post it to our website. Um, we share it in social media. And we also make sure that it's a piece that every donor and every board member has um, to reference and then also uh, in our newsletter that they can keep it and reference it whenever. But we really talk about we don't support um, 
keeping the lights on. We don't pay the electri electricity bill. That's a city thing. But we do cover the above and beyond. So anything that's innovative, anything that is something that's new and unique um, to our service. So I know other libraries had um, provided Hoopla, the streaming service, in the past. Hoopla is relatively new for us. And so when I have a conversation with our library director around funding a new service or a new program, my question to her is often, how long do you want donor dollars to fund this? And if it is successful, at what point will you be rolling it into your regular operations? So we're that test vehicle for innovative, innovative services. Um, Lynda.com or Reference USA are two services that we funded um, at around twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars annually for three years, and they were both successful. So um, she was able to roll them into her annual operating budget. There are other examples of this, and um, things that will always be um, funded by donor dollars include our summer learning program called the Summer Dare. That is the above and beyond the programs and services. This year it looks very different, um, but that is something that the foundation dollars will continue to fund. Dolly Parton's Imagination Library is another foundation-owned, foundation-funded program. So there are things, um, even library staff development. So the foundation funds all library staff development and staff appreciation and volunteer recognition um, dollars for our library too. So making sure that you can differentiate and then explain how um, something might be rolled into operational or taxpayer dollars um, in the long term has been very important and very powerful to share to our donors and stakeholders. Okay, okay, great. Amber, anything or would, I am very happy to go on. We have two other wonderful questions. Um, I might just add on to that. Um, as much as it's important for the donor and the, the external stakeholder to understand what the foundation funds, it's equally important for your city stakeholders um, and your like your city council to understand why it's their job to fund the day-to-day um, -day physical operations mm -hmm. of your library like a city department, if that's who you are, that's who we are in Cedar Rapids. I know the funding models vary in other places, but I do think it's critically important that, and we discovered this post-levy when people started asking questions like, well, when is the library going to operate in the black? wait a minute, <laughs> that's not what we do, right? And so you really, that's when it becomes critically important for you to have those conversations with both the stakeholders within the system, so whether that's the city or the county government, and also with your greater community so that they understand um, what a community's role is in funding the basics of having a library. Um, that's when people understand that it's their job to keep the doors open and the lights turned on so that we can have the books and have the spaces and have those you know, very fundamental programs, um, the foundation and your supporting organizations are the ones that make it possible for us for us to go above and beyond. And that's wonderful, but we need to be able to take care of the library within our community using those tax dollars. Okay, okay, great. So um, two questions for you with the time that we have left, pardon me while I look at them. Um, when working to get an appointment, any advice on how to get that meeting? Uh, is it staff member scheduling, volunteer, who would like to go first? I can jump in on this. Um, yeah, thank you, Amber. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a staff member who coordinates that internally using technology. I think we use Sign Up Genius in order to coordinate between the stakeholders who are, are like our um, community, sorry, our foundation members or our staff members, our board members, whoever the um, person is that we're sending out to meet with our city council members, for example. Um, we want to make sure that we understand their availability. So we coordinate all of that first. And then we send them out through a, uh, our administrative assistant who coordinates with the external stakeholders schedules. I think it's easier if you have somebody internally who can actually manage it, but technology is the best tool. Okay, okay, great. We do have um, some advocacy committee members, foundation board members, friends board members, things like that, that they have personal relationships with some of them. And sometimes they say, hey, let me do this offline. Um, but um, Amber's correct. Having our admin do it really covers all the bases and kind of controls the process to make sure everyone is seen. Okay. Now, another question for you both is, 
talk more about the materials that you've prepared in charity you were referring to those and i think that people are probably wanting a direct line to that so i'll let you go first so the materials that i provide are very foundation focused and basically how our donor dollars are used to support innovative programs that align with the um, strategic priorities of the library i think the packet typically put together for candidates um, is much more polished and much more focused on library operations, library achievements, library stories and strategy. And um, I know that whoever asked this question was very, was asking about, is it a Word document or is it a slick or whatnot? So I'm going to let Amber talk about that particular piece because it really is pretty specific. Yeah, so we compile packets based on who the audience member is that we're visiting with. But generally, like for city council, for example, what we're providing those people with would be our annual report so that they can see the basics of the numbers as well as some of the stories that the library has um, accumulated over the last year. We have some specific facts and figures, so budget numbers that apply directly to the library. We're also including any sort of um, informational piece. So we do a, a quarterly magazine, for example, that has some stories about the library and library use, as well as um, a list of all of our programs for that quarter um, and some promotional items in it. We include that. So as much of the swag about the library as we can include, we will. Um, but you, we also will include just a Word document with some key messages that relate to whatever the goal is around the time that we're meeting with them. We also have a strategic plan document that's a three year plan and we include that when we meet with these stakeholders as well. I want to chime in that um, Amber and her team really only um, create a small run of slicks of really high quality and those are the pieces that we use with our candidates and our um, and our elected officials. We want it to look good. We want them to be proud and we want them to be able to show them, um, show these pieces. And so um, it's not something that she's doing a mass, you know, $10,000 print job of these slick pieces. It's a relatively small print job, but they are very high quality materials that we're providing to these candidates and the elected officials because we want them to be proud and be able to show them and have them sitting on their desk as a piece or a talking point um, when they're visiting with others. Okay. Okay, great. Well, ladies, I, I do want to thank you so much for your time. And I'm sorry that we missed John. He is in such demand that he was actually speaking at another conference. So we were lucky to have him. So thanks again, Charity and Amber. We so enjoyed hearing from you lovely ladies and have a good one. We hope to see all of you at 2.30. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.